Hello, and welcome to Legal Management Talk, the official podcast of the Association of Legal Administrators. I'm your host, Justin Askenazy. Our guest today is Dr. Heidi Gardner, distinguished fellow at Harvard Law School and an expert on all things leadership and office dynamics. She recently co-authored a book titled Smarter Collaboration, A New Approach to Breaking Down Barriers and Transforming Work, where she discusses how leaders can use collaboration to problem solve and innovate. She is also a co-author of a column in the upcoming issue of Legal Management that details how legal managers can get a seat at the strategy table. Welcome, Heidi. It's great to have you on the show. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. So as I mentioned, the title of your book is Smarter Collaboration. Can you tell us in a nutshell what that means and how managers can begin to implement that strategy? <laughs> if I can encapsulate a whole uh, 20 years of research and a couple of books in a few sentences, what we are really talking about is the need for organizations, law firms, and all of their clients to tackle today's complex and nuanced problems in a way that is hyper-intentional and future-focused. And that requires people to be really clear about what these complex problems are, be they sustainability or talent retention in a highly dynamic marketplace or um, some of the very real and complex challenges that clients are facing with economic uncertainty and political uncertainty com combined with supply chain uncertainty and identifying those kinds of problems and then peeling back to say, whose expertise or different points of view would allow us to tackle those in a more complete and holistic way than any of the experts could do on their own. That's what we mean by smarter collaboration. So, uh, administrators are facing challenges nowadays regarding employee wellness and the new hybrid work environment, uh, looming financial headwinds, among the many other things they juggle. Uh, how can collaboration help alleviate some of these concerns? Well, it's not so much alleviate it as it is find a more appropriate way of addressing those challenges. So, I mean, let's, you know, let's pick up any one of those, the looming economic uncertainty. Well, that sounds like it could be just a question maybe for the CFO. What are we going to do financially? Well, okay, not so fast. Then you think about what are the ramifications for clients. You want to make sure you've got um, the right kinds of client experts involved here so you can do proper forecasting and so that you can figure out how you're advising clients and taking the new economic realities into consideration. And then you probably need client by client to bring people together who are experts in that industry. Because clearly the economics uh, are going to be very different if you're looking at a bank that's been highly acquisitive versus looking at um, someone, you know, a client in the hospitality and leisure industry that's going to be facing a different set of economic headwinds. And so when we are talking about any of those complex challenges, we need legal administrators to understand what's happening inside the firm and what are the effects with clients that will um, draw on a range of different kinds of perspectives and say, what do we need to do now in order to get out in front of this challenge and frankly, to get out in front of the competition? And you know, any administrator who's looking at it from their functional or departmental silo or is really only taking an internal perspective is almost certainly going to miss some important points. Uh, on any given problem, how many external perspectives would, should uh, an administrator be looking for? Oh, well, that's obvious. I mean, there's only one answer. It depends, right? There's no magic formula whatsoever. We're talking about being very outcome driven. So what is the problem that you're trying to solve for or the opportunity you're trying to tackle? And then peeling that back, really dissecting it and saying, how do we think about the different kinds of experts beyond perhaps the usual suspects whose brain power will be important right in the beginning? Now, this is not to say you can't layer on different kinds of experts as the problem unfolds, but getting the right experts around the proverbial table, whether that's literally a table or on the Zoom screen, getting the right people involved from the start is massively important. And being hyper intentional about who those people are and making sure that every one of them who comes to that kickoff meeting understands the role that they should be playing. Those are all critical aspects of how to capture the value from getting the right experts around the table. And I dare say, 
you know, in law firms, in like, you know, many of the other kinds of clients that we serve at Gardner & Co., those are not uh, natural instincts necessarily. And part of what we need to do is overcome some of the human foibles and some of the less than optimal organizational structures that tend to keep people in their silos rather than bridging them or breaking through them. Right. So, of course, uh, collaboration is only as effective as the person facilitating it. How can bad leadership make it a challenge to problem solve uh, effectively? How long do you have? <laughs> I mean, there are a thousand ways that um, ineffective leadership undermines collaboration. Let's dive into a few of them. Um, first is not creating an environment of psychological safety. So psychological safety, it's a coin termed, uh, a term coined rather by one of my colleagues at Harvard Business School going on 20 years ago. Um, and it really captures the context, the climate in which people feel safe to contribute, to ask questions, to seek feedback, to admit mistakes and help the team learn from them. And it really is a leadership challenge to create an environment of psychological safety where people are not only willing to contribute, but actually motivated to contribute. Because there's absolutely no point getting a range of different kinds of experts or different um, hierarchical levels or different roles uh, around a table for a problem solving session and then, then not truly tapping into their different points of view and respecting those, valuing them and using them in an integrated way. So a leader, first of all, has to create this kind of psychological safety. Unfortunately, what we often see is perhaps in the interest of time, a leader cracks on, stays very task focused, boom, boom, boom. And that means they take probably either the first idea that's contributed or more likely the one that's contributed by somebody who is higher status. And they latch onto that and don't make space for more innovative or outside um, uh, outside in perspectives. Um, and so I think that, that leaders can undermine psych safety. They can undermine collaboration by doing that. I think if I can mention just one more piece, in the context of legal administrators, I think that overly deferential people are sometimes problematic leaders. Um, and we know, unfortunately, in law firms, like in a lot of other kinds of professional service firms and companies, there can be a sort of caste system or a class system where it seems like some people who are either client facing or in a tech company, maybe it's the engineers or in a hospital, it's the physicians, you know, some people are higher status than others. And problematically, um, leaders who buy into those status differentials in the context of a problem solving discussion or a brainstorm or uh, an opportunity spotting session, they really undermine people's ability to bring in their unique perspectives. Because uh, what we see is that oftentimes, and I've studied this for well over 20 years at this point, what we often see is leaders setting the tone where it's assumed that because somebody is more senior, uh, more tenured, has a different kind of role, that we should automatically buy into what they're suggesting. And uh, innovation never happens like that. Uh, and so I'd say that leaders really need to get comfortable with the idea of challenging the status quo, challenging the status hierarchy, and role modeling that for their people. For sure. So um, you just mentioned kind of what makes a good leader. Uh, you know, good leadership can make for an efficient and happy work environment. So what are some of the other key qualities that make a good leader? Uh, one of the most important things is really paying attention to engagement. You know, by engagement, we we mean people's willingness to lean into the work, to commit their emotional resources, their cognitive resources? Do they think about work and the challenges and the opportunities, even when they're not technically you know, tasked with doing something particular? And there are gobs of, of research studies out there that show that more engaged employees produce highly quantifiable, desirable outcomes, like greater revenues and profits, higher client satisfaction, and of course, um, more perhaps most importantly, um, the ability to attract and retain an, uh, a great talent. And so you look at those kinds of outcomes and leaders absolutely have to be paying attention to engagement, um, not treating it as an afterthought or some kind of soft topic. 
Um, and so leaders have to be collecting data on this on a regular basis. It's not an annual event and it shouldn't be something that gets delegated to the HR function. It should be something that leaders are on top of through pulse surveys, you know, periodic frequent short surveys just to keep their finger on the pulse of how engaged people are. And when they start to see patterns, they need to jump in proactively. They need to understand what it is that is causing either a dip or a rise in engagement. Um, I think uh, um, it's not at all recommended only to pay attention to trends in the wrong direction. If leaders see a trend in the right direction, they should try to understand why it's working and how to replicate that in other parts of the organization. So when leaders pay attention to engagement, it really supercharges the ability of people to um, uh, contribute their best. I think hand in hand with that kind of engagement is an inclusive leader, um, somebody who is actively seeking out differences and managing those differences in a way that are constructive and productive. Merely getting uh, diversity on a team is absolutely no guarantee that that diversity be, will, will be used um, for good outcomes. And in fact, mismanaged diversity can undermine performance. And so leaders need to be skilled at bringing people together who have different perspectives, different life experiences, and different points of view, and running conversations in ways where it's healthy and natural for people to challenge each other. You know, if you and I are working on uh, a piece together, whether that's an internally facing project or something that will ultimately um, uh, affect client service, we need to actively understand where we have different points of view. Because if we aren't different enough from one another in terms of how we think about the problem or what experiences we bring to bear, there's no point having both of us working together. Then we're just you know, four hands and two brains, but those two brains and four hands aren't really doing much more than, you know, we could if we were working independently. So leaders should encourage people to seek out those differences, understand why those differences are important uh, for solving whatever problem that they're, they're addressing at the time, um, and then help to resolve um, anything that hints of interpersonal conflict rather than task conflict. You know, task conflict is the debate, the challenge, the the um, the 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 um, mixing it up on the content side. But leaders should create the kind of environment where people willingly willingly engage that way with each other, and sometimes tough conversations and arguments and so forth. And then making sure that there's enough trust amongst those people, so that everyone understands that they're on the same page, they're challenging each other, so that they get the best possible outcome and that they are um, in no way at all challenging each other for insidious reasons, like you know making somebody look stupid in front of their peers. But it's a leadership task to make sure that task conflict flourishes and relationship conflict is driven out of the organization as much as possible. Right. And to build on that even more, uh, compassion is obviously an important element of managing employees. How can compassion best be used in a legal environment and how can that help employee performance? You know, I'm really glad you brought this up because there is a mistaken belief that managers and leaders and individuals need to make a trade off between high performance and compassion, as if exhibiting compassion is um, letting people do whatever they need to do to take care of themselves. Uh, not so fast, right? Sometimes you know, when we think about compassion, it's empathy that gets applied in the most constructive way possible. So for me to be compassionate, I have to understand what somebody is going through. And then I have to ideally co-create with them some kind of a solution to help them manage through some difficulties or indeed to play, um, you know, to, to play up to, to some joy or some, um, some positive uh, outcomes that are happening for them. But, you know, typically we think about compassion when there's some sort of problem for an employee. When we are compassionate towards our colleagues, toward our direct reports, and indeed even towards the, 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 the people who are um, uh, uh, more experienced, more tenured, higher on the organizational hierarchy than we are, showing compassion in a 360 degree way helps to drive performance because it reinforces the sense of belonging for people. Um, it really helps them um, understand where they can 
uh, let up a little bit in terms of their effort because somebody else is going to help to reshape their responsibilities, if perhaps in a temporary or permanent way. It's also going to um, give people enough breathing space that they can get through a tough time. Um, and by exhibiting compassion, um, leaders, colleagues, peers are able to create that space for people to um, regain their productive footing um, and ideally to bounce back. Resilience is at an all-time low or is, you know, maybe we're slowly um, getting our resilience um, back, but I think it's nowhere near where it was pre-pandemic. And as leaders, we're going to have to be um, hyper vigilant that we are um, exhibiting compassion in the right ways so that it's truly constructive. And that will in turn unleash performance at the individual and the group level. And I also want to ask about compassion towards ourselves, because yeah. certainly leaders are you know, dealing with a lot on a day-to-day -day basis. And so, you know, what advice would you have for those uh, administrators who might be feeling uh, overwhelmed by everything they have going on? Yeah, absolutely. I think the first thing is recognizing that this is, is real. Um, I think uh, for a long time, there was the hero myth where we were just supposed to um, bear more and more and more and more and not admit that we were getting crushed sometimes. Um, I think um, recognizing the power of self-reflection and the ability to admit when things are overwhelming is absolutely crucial. I would hope that every person um, at work has somebody that they can turn to uh, to, to talk about that kind of um, feeling of being overwhelmed. I hope people also have somebody outside of work that they can talk to, whether it's in a professional capacity like a, a therapist or a counselor or a coach or um, somebody who's very supportive on, on the personal side, like a friend or a family member. But beyond that, I think from a very pragmatic perspective um, in the work context, we should be very thoughtful about what it is that's making us feel burnt out or overwhelmed, et cetera. Sometimes it's workload. I mean, just the sheer amount of work. More often, we see it being a combination of a couple other very specific things. One is what I call overcommitment. It's people being spread too thinly across too many different things. Um, and what we know is that if you've got, you know, 10 projects that each require four hours a week, it is way more draining to spend those 40 hours than it is to work on two projects that each require 20 hours a week. Now that's a slightly oversimplified example, but nonetheless, it makes the point that when we are spread thinly across many priorities at once, it's a recipe for burnout. Because what we don't acknowledge is the switching costs. Um, moving from one project to another is actually cognitively very taxing. And to try to juggle that many different relationships and competing priorities at once is really taxing. So overcommitment is often a source of feeling overwhelmed at work. And there are some very real steps that people can take to address that. One is to start by documenting how many different pieces they're actually working on at any given time um, and to bring that to, to people's attention. Because my hunch is in an organization where one person is feeling spread too thin, there are a lot of other people um, who are spread, spread equally thin um, and feeling probably overwhelmed. The, the, the big question is, how do um, firms restructure people's responsibilities so that they're not overcommitted at any given time. I think that's a really healthy and productive conversation for people to raise. Um, thinking uh, further about why it is that people are feeling overwhelmed, it could be a lack of a perceived lack of support. And this might mean support in a social sense. People might not feel like they connect with other individuals. Um, and that's a very real problem. Um, there's it's quite a bit of research that shows how uh, work in this post-pandemic age has created an epidemic of loneliness. Um, and loneliness is not just a touchy-feely topic. There are very clearly documented um, physical and mental health um, adverse uh, outcomes associated with loneliness. And feeling lonely is not that you don't have connection, that you don't have contact with other people, is that you don't have connection with those people. And so sometimes, you know, for people working from home, for example, or working in a hybrid environment, they might have this cognitive dissonance where 
on the screen, they're surrounded by 15 other people. And they get off that meeting and they think, how could I possibly be feeling so disconnected, so lonely? I was just in a meeting with 15 people. But if you didn't actually connect with anyone, if you didn't have a personal exchange with them, um, if you don't have any, any sort of ongoing relationship professionally with them, it can exacerbate this feeling of loneliness. And think about it, overcommitment and loneliness at the same time, you put those, just two of those factors, which are highly prevalent in the post-pandemic workplace, um, and it's no wonder people are feeling overwhelmed. So, you know, I could keep going, but what I'm asking people to think about is try to zoom in and be somewhat objective and analytical, tough task when it's, you know, when you're feeling overwhelmed already, but, you know, talking through one of those people who are your support um, um, uh who are your supports, both inside and outside the workplace, maybe you can zero in on some specific reasons that you're feeling overwhelmed and start to take action there. Sure. I think that's such a great strategy as we try to come out of the, the pandemic and everything that's that's been associated with that. Um, so lastly, I want to kind of uh, look at the present and the future. What does being a good leader look like in 2023? Um, many of us are still not back in the office full time, if we ever will be, uh, plus the aforementioned concerns around employee wellness and ever-changing technology standards, and you know I could go on, but how can effective leaders adapt to the current environment? So we've talked already about a number of characteristics of, of leaders, and I think some of those are going to continue to be absolutely vital. Um, psychological safety is is um, is absolutely crucial. I think one other aspect for leaders um, as we're coming into 2023 is to help people deal with ambiguity. Um, there's so much uncertainty. Um, uh, you know, nobody's got a crystal ball and never has. But I think right now there's um, there is so much uncertainty um, driven by the economy and um, political uncertainty and global unrest and social divides that leaders have to um, create the sort of spaces where people can wrestle with some of that ambiguity and understand what a path looks forward, irrespective of some specific types of outcomes. Right? And, you know, we're, we're facing layoffs right now. You know, we keep hearing daily headlines of of layoffs or impending downsizing, et cetera. People are naturally scared about their jobs. Um, an honest leader um, will help people to cope with that uncertainty, um, not giving people false hope, but recognizing that it is a source of uncertainty and, um, and helping to people to um, work through the anxiety that's associated with it. And to the extent possible, um, laying out some things that are certain for people. So. Again, can't make um, false promises about people, you know, guaranteed to keep their jobs or whatever. But what is it that would allow people to understand how, you know, as long as this um, turbulent time frame exists, what do we know will continue to happen? You know, how do you count on one another? What are the kinds of um, processes that you can put in place that people can can lean on? Um, you know, how do you think about crafting an environment where whether people are in the office or not? they're still able to access support systems. Um, you know, how do people get regular feedback? One thing that's hugely important um, in times of economic uncertainty where people are scared about their job is to help people think about continuing to upgrade their skills and capabilities and their confidence in them. So this is um, as, as um, counterintuitive as it sounds, this is a great time to invest in training people because it sends a very strong signal that whether they stay with your firm and you capitalize on their capabilities or indeed whether the um, economy changes and they're not going to be part of your firm, you're still invested in them while they are. So, you know, leaders who can help um, deal with some of the uncertainty and ambiguity, ideally by in investing in their people and sending signals of support, I think make a, a huge difference. And in 2023, we really need that. Definitely. Well, uh, thanks so much, Heidi, for um, all the uh, advice and insight that, uh, that you've given us. Uh, thanks for coming on. Absolutely. My pleasure. I'm so glad people are interested in these topics. I think it's absolutely crucial. Yep. Uh, thanks so much to our viewers, listeners, and subscribers for tuning in. Uh, if you want to hear more, you can always uh, subscribe on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. 
And you can learn more about ALA at alanet.org. Until next time.